In this unit, I want to get just a little bit more into the relationship between race, representation, and portrait photography. Photography, particularly portrait photography, has always been enormously powerful in, uh, in determining the way that different peoples of the world are represented. It's been a very positive force, but also a very negative force, both promoting and denigrating different groups of people particularly people of color. So I want to go back to the very origins of photography. I want to talk about when and where it was invented, by whom, who used photography, and uh, who took pictures of whom, uh, just to sort of unpack this history of how portrait photography was used and has been used and continues to be used um, in the way that it represents different peoples. Okay, well, let's go back to the very beginning, to 1839. That's probably not quite the actual beginning. So that is the year that two viable photographic processes were invented and announced. One by Louis Daguerre, who you see right here, of France, and one by Henry Fox Talbot, with a little bit of help from this man, John Herschel. Now, what is it that all of the three of these people have in common? Yes, they are all white men, and they're all well-to-do white men. So let's talk a little bit more about why photography was invented in Europe and invented by essentially three white men. <laughs> well, it's not really a coincidence. Europe at this time is quite wealthy, quite powerful, stockpiling a lot of wealth, colonizing the world, and they have a revolution going on called the Industrial Revolution, uh, which means that there's an enormous amount of energy around inventions. Now, the wealth also means that there's a lot of people like Henry Fox Talbot, like Louis Daguerre, and like John Herschel, who actually have time and money. They don't have to worry about their day job. Uh, they're part of this new group of people uh, known as the middle class, the middle and the upper classes. Um, now, not everybody was well-to-do. There were plenty of people who were still incredibly poor, uh, but this group of people, mostly white men, actually had a little bit more time and a little bit more money, which an invention and uh, a process like photography really needed because nobody knew at the time that it was actually going to make money. So you needed to be able to be free for it to fail. And uh, so it required concentrated wealth. Okay, so these three white men invent photography. And what happens? That means that they then teach other white men how to do photography. Um, other white men who have money learn how to do photography because at the very beginning, photography wasn't anything like it is now. It wasn't on our phone. It wasn't even a disposable camera you could buy at the drugstore. It was very complicated. It was very expensive and it was very time consuming. And the only people generally who had time for that were wealthy white men. Um, so now you have these wealthy white men with their big cameras and they are taking pictures of everybody else. This actually invents the concept of the other. That is that everybody who is not a white European male is somebody else, is the other. Um, that is that there's some kind of central force, which is white males who are actually looking at the rest of the world. And this is exactly what happened with photography. Once photography became more viable once cameras became almost possible to pack up, definitely not in your pocket, wealthy white people got on the road and went to other parts of the world and made photographs of those people. Uh, this is a photograph by a whole group of photographers, French photographers, uh, the family Bonfi, uh, who made a number of photographs, hundreds of photographs in the Middle East. And one of the things to notice about the photographs that you'll see that I'm going to show you, these are all made by wealthy white Europeans who traveled to other parts of the world and made photographs of everybody who was not a wealthy white uh, European. Uh, these have this air of what we think of as exoticism. That is, these photographers are deliberately picturing people who are different from the white Europeans. 
Um, and these photographs, the primary market for them, you have to understand, were also white Europeans. People were making these photographs, turning them into postcards, and then either sending them back to Europe or selling them to other Western travelers as they traveled. So this was a whole business of representation that was created, invented, developed by white Euro Europeans that then represented everybody else. Well, let's take a look at a couple more of these early white European photographers. Uh, this is Francis Frith. Um, he was Scottish and this was a fairly typical thing for these early travel uh, photographers to do, these early entrepreneurs, was to travel to all these foreign places and uh, dress up in costume. And that is exactly the way they thought of it. And this is something you'll see throughout this history of representation is that oftentimes people who are not West, who are not Western European white um, are thought to be in costume. Um, uh, again, this idea of exoticism and separation. So Francis Frith is dressed up as an Egyptian. He is not an Egyptian. He photographed a great deal in Egypt. And again, these photographs of uh, people who are distinctly not Western and not European were, um, were primarily marketed back to Western uh, white European peoples. Now, um, another area of early photography uh, that's going to take us on a little bit of a reverse route uh, was photography in Japan. So Japan, until the mid to late um, 19th century, had been closed to outside visitors. It had been closed for over 200 years. No Western person had been to Japan during that time. Once Japan was opened to Western Europe, um, a lot of early sort of uh, wealthy, ambitious, adventurous white Europeans went to, went to Japan to see what Japan looked like. Um, nobody from the outside of Japan had seen Japan for 200 years. Among them were, of course, white photographers. Um, and one of the most famous of them was Felix Beato. He was, uh, he was an Italian photographer. He went all over the world, but he settled for a number of years in Japan and set up a portrait studio there where he took photographs of, you guessed it, people who were Japanese and who looked very, very different from white Western people. Um, and then these photographs of women uh, bathing, of uh, samurai soldiers with tattoos, um, um, half naked in the studio, were all sold back to Western Europe um, as souvenirs. Now, this is, um, this is definitely right in the territory of the idea of the other, of white European men picturing others. And Felix Beato's work isn't all like this, but there's a lot of it that is very, very invasive. Uh, people are vulnerable, there's a lot of skin, uh, there's a little bit of titillation, and this was fairly typical of a lot of Western European photographs of people in other parts of the world. Uh, but the good news about what happened in uh, Japan is that Felix Beato actually um, passed photography on to Japan's first photographer, uh, Kusakabe Kimbei. So he taught Kusakabe Kimbei photography, and when he got bored and decided to go back to Europe, Kusakabe Kimbei took over Felix Beato's studio. And he made absolutely fantastic photographs. Now, the hard part is that these were still photographs that were largely marketed to the West, but not entirely. The really positive news, and this is something that we see pushing back and forth throughout the history of photography, is that we now have someone who is Japanese making photographs of people who are Japanese. And this is an important consideration when you're thinking about representation. Who is the photographer and who is being photographed? And how, is, how are the notions of the photographer um, affecting the way that people are represented? Well, let me share a couple more photographs from Kusakabe Kimbei. These are mostly taken in the studio. Kimbei also uh, was a wonderful uh, hand coloring artist. Uh, he learned that also from Beato. 
So all photography did begin in Europe and traveled out from there. It is an ethnocentric uh, invention. However, eventually uh, we had white men going all over the world, taking photography with them and gradually uh, photographers in those places emerged, they learned photography, and they began to turn the camera around. So we also have the photographer A Fang Lai in China. I love his photographs, beautiful studio photographs, and you can see that uh, they're following the traditions of what they were taught by Western photographers, but it begins to take on its own form. And we also have Lala Dean Dayal, who was the official photographer to the Indian royal family, um, who had his own studio in Bombay. Now, let's go back to the United States. I want to talk a little bit about the representation of Native Americans. And then when we get to the late 19th and into the 20th century, I want to really focus on the representation of African Americans because that is its own particular history. This is a huge topic. I could go in about 50 different directions. Uh, so, but for this class, I just want to touch on a couple of really important sort of germane uh, stories and ideas. So the photograph you're looking at right now is a photograph of a Native American uh, chief, a Sioux chief, by Edward Curtis. Um, Edward Curtis is probably the single most famous photographer of Native Americans. Edward Curtis, of course, was a white American, uh, descended from white Europeans, um, and his photographs are absolutely beautiful and very, very, shall I say, popular. And his intentions were very, very, um, very good. He saw that Native Americans were likely disappearing, diminishing. Um, the, white, um, the, the, the white settlers were taking over their land, killing them, murdering them, throwing them off of their land. Um, and so his intention was uh, to document this vanishing race. However, and I've uh, put some links to articles for you to look at, uh, there's a little bit of a controversy about his representation. Uh, first and foremost, he was a white American uh, representing Native Americans, not a Native American representing Native Americans. Secondly, there's a, a fairly good uh, indication historically that he often didn't bother to try to, he didn't fully recognize that different tribes uh, were absolutely different peoples with different clothing and different traditions. And he would often uh, just bring a box of props and just dress people up, uh, pay them a little bit, and uh, they were willing to sort of play these native roles for him. But Edward, Curtis, uh, Edward Curtis's photographs are absolutely stunning, beautiful, still collector's items today. And they are an important record of certain, import, of certain key uh, Native American figures. Now, there were um, other photographers who photographed Native Americans. These were also white people. They were also descended from Europeans who had a little bit more of an intimate and authentic approach to photographing Native Americans. Um, they uh, always uh, approached them where they were, and they always, um, uh, they never controlled how they were dressed. One of them was Adam Roman, um, and here are a couple of his photographs. He photographed primarily the Hopi people. Okay, well, let's segue into another territory of representation. Um, one of the, the most complicated and important and um, I would say sensitive, and that is the representation of African Americans. And of course, African Americans uh, were still enslaved for the better part of the 19th century, and they were enslaved in the United States when photography was invented in 1839. Frederick Douglass was a freed slave. He actually freed himself. It's a very long story of emancipation and uh, took a number of years to actually fully become officially emancipated. He became an important activist, a writer, and an advocate for, uh, for the rights of 
all African Americans, but most especially he was an advocate and an activist for um, the population of freed slaves who were trying to make um, a new life in the country that had enslaved them. Frederick Douglass, interestingly enough, was the most photographed man of the 19th century, the most photographed human. The only person who came close was Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he was photographed 120 times, Frederick Douglass about 160 times. Now, of course, by our iPhone uh, calculations, that seems like almost nothing. Uh, but in the 19th century, it was a big deal. And this was not an accident. Frederick Douglass made sure that he was photographed and made sure that he was photographed in a very particular way. He understood that photographic representation meant everything, that, uh, that how African Americans were represented in photographs could make or break how they were represented and how they were treated in, um, in, the, in the actual world. So each of his photographs, he looks powerful, he looks dignified, he is not smiling because he thinks the idea of representation is a very somber um, idea, a very serious idea. Often looking directly into the camera, which was not that common in the 19th century. And he continued to be photographed until his old age. So very, very powerful story of representation um, and a very powerful story of using the representation of African-Americans in order to move the, the, move the status of African-Americans forward. There were forces that were going in another direction during this very same time. As we all know, we know that um, the, uh, the Civil War was was bitter and that the Civil War is not really, has never been completely over. Um, we're going to come back to that when we talk about a contemporary photographer. Now I want to just segue just a, a little bit as we head into the late 19th century, early 20th century, and go back to um, a white photographer, a very interesting white photographer from the pictorialist. Frederick Holland Day was almost certainly gay. He was part of a group of people uh, known as the dandies, and that was a euphemism uh, for people who were gay. He was actually the victim of serious homophobia by the leader of the American secessionist or pictorialist group, Alfred Stieglitz, um, who continually rebuffed him, despite his really very amazing talent. Now, he also uh, got into a bit of a reputation scuffle um, when he made these magnificent photos of, of an African-American uh, friend of his, a freed slave, um, as a Nubian prince. And these photographs were considered absolutely shocking, um, not just because the, they were a, a nude male, which was considered very um, uh, unacceptable at the time, but also because they were photographs of an African-American man being presented as royalty. So he was really quite ahead of his time. He, uh, he never was able to quite transcend Stieglitz during his time, but he's becoming much more well-known in our present day. 